This conference will now be recorded. All right, hi everyone. Welcome to one of our stormwater webinars done by the USGS in cooperation with Susan Jones of the, the Federal, High Off Federal Highway Office of Project Delivery and Environmental Review. Today we have Daniel Sharar Salgado of the Federal Highway Hydraulics and Ge Geotechnical Team who will discuss the Federal Highway Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, CMIP tool. It's a simple means to incorporate future climate data into everyday planning and, and engineering workflows. All right, Daniel, uh, I'll mute myself and you can take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. All right, let me go ahead and go to full screen. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Daniel. I work with the hydraulics and geotech team at FHWA headquarters, as Greg said, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about our CMIP tool and uh, just a little bit kind of, we're gonna go through a little bit of the climate stuff behind the CMIP tool, you know, how you might consider incorporating climate information into hydrologic analysis and design. Um, we're gonna go on to just briefly kind of walk you through the CMIP tool. This is not a step-by-step, -step. Um, we do have a webinar posted online where you can watch that and we have a user guide as well. And I'll give you information about that throughout the uh, presentation. Um, but this is just a kind of quick run through to give you a, an idea. And then we're gonna talk about a couple of examples of how you can use the tool or how you might consider using the tool. Um, and at the end, we're gonna talk about some things to keep an eye out for in the upcoming future. So this is uh, what the lawyers make us put it in. I call it the common sense disclaimer. It essentially says, if it's not in law or regulation, you don't have to do it. <laughs> so all these things I'm telling you, you don't have to do it unless it's in your law or regulation. Lawyers ask us to put this in here. Um, so I'm Daniel. I was going to put a picture, but I forgot. I apologize. Um, if you really want a picture, I can share one at the end. Uh, I've been with FHWA for about three years. Um, before that, I was with the Maryland Department of uh, Transportation, um, their State Highway Administration. I started off doing stormwater design for the first uh, four or five years. Uh, after that, I transitioned into doing bridge hydraulics design and large scale hydraulic design. Uh, and then um, after that, I came over to FHWA and have been working in the headquarters. At FHWA, uh, I do a little bit of everything, but my, my focus has predominantly been on figuring out ways to incorporate climate data into hydraulic practice and uh, figuring out ways to improve our coastal practice. That's what I've been focusing on most in the past year or so. <clears throat> and the FHWA has been working to incorporate climate data for about 15 years or so. Um, Rob Kafalenos and Brian Buclair, um, who was here before me, he retired shortly after I started, um, had been working on this for a very long time. And they took this quite a ways to really make it practical and usable to uh, everyday practitioners. So one of I've given a couple of these presentations at point on either the CMIP tool or resilience. And, and one of the ways I always like to start the presentation is with this, the question, what is the risk, right? So one of the things we do, uh, especially our resilience group, whenever they talk to someone, they say, you know, consider climate in every project you do. And, and that at, at first glance is a little daunting, right? You know, that's scary. Why, why should I be considering climate in everything I do? Isn't that a lot of work? Well, it might be and it might not, right? So let's let's take a quick example. Let's say you're building a sediment trap. Your sediment trap's gonna be there for a year or two, right? And then you're gonna, you know, pave over it or do whatever you're gonna do. You're gonna fill it up and then you're gonna go about your day. So take a second, let's think about climate. Is the climate really gonna change? Are you gonna have an increased a worsened rainfall within those two years statistically? And the answer is probably not, right? And so you say, okay, well, I've considered climate, check, and I don't have to do anything. So that is one of the first things we say when we say consider climate. Take a second and think, is this actually a risk factor for things of that short nature? Probably not, right? But now if you look over to the left at this picture, right, you've got a bridge. That bridge is going to be there for a long time. I think Ashdo has a, bridges are supposed to have a service life of 75 years, 
right? So in 75 years, it's pretty likely that, that the climate's going to change. And so now you, you take a second, you say, okay, well, climate's probably going to change. It's probably going to make a difference. Okay, well, now what's my failure consequence, right? And what's my site risk? And, you know, so on the left, there's probably no good detour for that bridge over that bay, right? So there's not only is there huge damage and huge costs to replace those decks on the bridge that were knocked off, there's probably, <coughs> excuse me, there's probably um, lots of commuter costs, lots of, of issues to daily life, right? Costs that you can't necessarily just measure easily um, with, with, you know, a monetary value, right? Social costs are, are huge there. Now, if we look over to the right, I apologize. So I, I have a little bit of asthma, so I, I may cough through this presentation. I'll, I'll do my best not to cough directly into your ears. I apologize. Um, but let's take a look at the picture to the right. That's a small culvert. It's on a road. You know, in that road, there may be multiple detours. Um, that culvert probably has a similar service life to the bridge, but, you know, the, the damage and the consequences are not nearly as bad as that bridge over the bay. It's going to be much cheaper to replace. You'll have alternate routes. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you probably don't need to put the same level of effort into anal analyzing that culvert as you do that bridge over the bay. The bay bridge, you know, I would say, hey, hire a coastal engineer, probably hire a climate scientist, right? Just make these considerations because you're going to need a good analysis for that high risk. Whereas this one over here, you don't necessarily want to hire the, the culvert to the right. You don't necessarily, you definitely don't need a coastal engineer and you probably don't need a climate scientist. And so part of the reason I bring this discussion up at the beginning is you still might want to consider climate for that small culvert, but you don't want to go as far as doing a PhD project. And so that's sort of the sweet spot our CMIP tool fits in, right? It's 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 a tool that is relatively easy, will get you some good climate information, um, but it's not the most robust tool in the world, and I wouldn't recommend it for very, very complex high-risk projects. But it's also better than nothing, right? It's better than just saying, you know, we don't want to pay for any climate information and let's just ignore it, right? Because there is still a risk based upon the climate. And so that's kind of where we fall, and we fall into that simple to medium level when you have that risk. And this is sort of the way you should think about every project you do. So why use the FHWA CMIP tool? Um, you know, climate is changing, right? Climate has been changing <laughs> since the Earth came into existence, right? And there are studies that show climate changes more based on human interactions, right? Understanding this will help your decision making. It will help you figure out not just your design, but also necessarily, also potentially backup plans, right? You know, if, if you know there's a higher risk of a structure somewhere, it, the only answer is not just design it sturdier or build the bridge taller or, you know, you have other options, right? You know, it protects public health, safety, and welfare, you know, keeping your system running and smooth. Um, and there's all sorts of costs, right, um, that make a difference long term, right? It, it's just not just um, whether the culvert or bridge fails or your stormwater site fails. It's also, you know, how how much are the maintenance upkeep, right? Is is the climate going to affect the sediment transport coming to your site? That tends to be a more complicated analysis than what we're going to talk about, but there are other considerations like that. So what is the FHWA CMIP tool? <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, to put it in simple tool terms, this tool takes a ton of data, right, from these high resolution climate data sets, right? People essentially build computer models, and we'll talk about this more in a second, that simulate and estimate how the climate's changing on the earth, right? And what's gonna happen in the future. And what it does is there's a ton of data and, it, and it's not always easy to parse through. And so this tool takes this data and it simplifies it for you and it puts it into sort of statistics that are easy to incorporate in your work, in your everyday workflow, right? And that's one of the big things. And the other big thing it does, and we'll talk about this a little later as well, is it puts it out in an Excel spreadsheet, which is nice. Um, 
you can do sorting of this data. Um, they come in NetCDF files usually, but you need a little bit of coding experience and not everybody has that. Um, it's, it's pretty common that people don't actually that work in the stormwater or the, the, um, the hydraulics field. There definitely are those that have it, but not everyone does. So, you know, almost everyone has Excel expertise and so they can manipulate those statistics and they can quickly add it into their design process. So, you know, the other bullets I have are that, you know, we talk about how projected precipitation is going to change. We also talk about changes in, in temperature, and this can be used by both planners and engineers in multiple ways. So now I'm going to take a second, and we're going to talk a little bit about the climate and just kind of understand why are we considering the climate? What, what is changing, and how do we incorporate that, right? And so it's it's there's three kind of processes into getting this climate data in a form that's useful to us. There's a lot of climate data, but it's not necessarily all helpful for what we do on a day to day basis of actually building infrastructure, right? Building a stormwater pond, building a BMP. You know, this 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 raw data doesn't necessarily help us. So so let's understand a little bit about what we might try to use. So the first is scenarios of human activity, right? RCP scenarios. And so this is the idea that, you know, we are putting out carbon into the environment through various sources, right? And climate scientists over the years have estimated that depending on how policies and people act going into the future, we're going to have various carbon emissions. Um, and there's actually a more exact way to say it, but this is sort of the simplified everyday speak, right? And depending on what happens, this is going to either increase the rate of warming or stabilize it or potentially decrease it. And <coughs> excuse me. And as a result, we, we've kind of plotted, the, the climate scientists have plotted different scenarios, right? They say, ah, uh, we don't care. Carbon goes through the roof. That's 8.5. Or, you know, 4.5 is one where we say, okay, you know, people start regulating it more and, and getting it under control. Um, I'll tell you right now, this is more of a policy issue. Um, this is not something I can tell you, oh, it's going to be 4.5 or 8.5, because I don't know. Um, these are a lot of very complex questions that I don't have the answer for. But, you know, these are the data sets that you're going to get. And so you need to be able to pick and choose which one. And picking and choosing um, is going to be based on your local policy, but it's also going to be based on your understanding of risk, right? And your tolerable risk for that site. Okay, and so now let's talk about a little bit about a climate model. What is a climate model? It's just essentially a, a, a numerical model, an Earth model that you run, right? And it and it sort of tells you how the Earth is changing, um, how the temperatures are changing, what's happening with the precip, things like that. So, you know, it's for those of you who have experience with hydraulic models, it's 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 the same idea, right? You're you these you break up the earth into all these little blocks. And then from one block to another, you're solving the equations and you're solving a lot of the different equations, right? And you're solving them all together and you have different equations for your ocean and your atmosphere and what they call your planetary boundary layer, right? Um, which is how the atmosphere interacts with the earth, the the, the ground surface. And these climate scientists run these big models, but because you're covering the whole Earth, you know, you're, 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 you can't run at a very fine detail. You just, there's not that much computing power. These, these are already using supercomputers, right? And so what they do is they create these giant models that cover the Earth with these giant grid cells. As an example, you might have a grid cell the size of Florida, right? So for the Earth, that's pretty refined, but you know, for your small little pond in one small little town in Florida, you know, a grid covering Florida doesn't exactly give you very accurate information, right? And so that takes us to our next step, which is called downscaling. So what happens is these climate scientists build these huge models, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, with these big cells. And then they chop them up, they downscale them. And there's a couple ways you can do the downscaling. Um, 
the way that we're going to focus on is called statistical downscaling. And you can see what that is here, right? You've got these big grids over here. You know, we've got that grid the size of Florida I was talking about. And you start cutting them up and cutting them up and getting them into smaller pieces. Um, for statistical downscaling, what you're doing is you're essentially creating your big model and then you're using an observed model, like measured temperatures, measured rainfall. This is These are real observations people have gone out and collected or, or, or synthesized. And then you're sort of calibrating your big model to these small focus points, and then you're running it into the future. That's, that's the basic idea of statistical modeling, right? Um, you're saying, okay, in the past, I know it rained this much here. I'm taking this big simulated model, and I'm tying it to these small little points. Dynamical downscaling, which we're not really going to talk about here, but I'll just throw it in there for fun, for learning. That's when you essentially just run a more refined model. So you, you have your global model, and then you say, okay, I'm just going to look at the U.S. And in the U.S., now I'm going to rerun this you know, with information from the bigger global model on the outside boundaries of the U.S., and I'm going to look at all these smaller squares now, right? Um, that area is not quite as refined as the statistical downscaling methods yet. And so that's why FHWA has focused on using statistical data at this time. That doesn't mean it's not useful. And there's a lot of good research that goes into that. And if you're interested in that, you can follow up and look up, look it up. But, but at this time, our tool only supports statistical models. And specifically, it supports one called the LOCA downscaling. And so, you know, let's let's go into how you use the CMIP tool, what the process is. <clears throat> and it looks a little intimidating at first. Once you get to do it a couple times, it takes about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's it's very, very easy once you get the feel for it. Um, I'll say 30 minutes to be conservative, right? It's it's easy. But, you know, it takes a little bit to learn. It takes a little bit to understand how you're doing everything. And so we're going to just walk you through the basic big picture steps first. So the first step is you actually got to download the data from an outside site. We don't provide the climate data. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. One, because other people provide it, makes our lives easier. Two, because we're not necessarily climate experts, right? You know, I, I am certainly not a climate expert. I've, I've done a little bit of reading, I've learned, and, and I've talked to people who have helped me understand this, but, but I'm not. And so we don't hold that data. Right. But we, we've done our fair share of due diligence to understand how you can use this data effectively and responsibly. And so the first thing you do is you go to the site. This is a site run by the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, it's such a service to the industry that, that they put this out for free. And you can go and, down, and download downscaled data anywhere within the contiguous U.S. Right. So sorry, Alaska. Sorry, Hawaii. And sorry, territories. It does not support those. But everywhere else within the US, we, we have good data that's downscaled in the local format. And so the next step when you're downloading your data is you pick the specific data you want because there's a lot of data out there, right? And so <clears throat> up at the top, you'll see there's a little circle, the little red dotted circle, and it's going around LOCA CMIP5 climate data. So that's essentially the data you pick when you're using our tool. We only focus on that data. In the future, we may try to add other data types, but for now, this is what we use. And it's good, it's a reasonable, good set of data. Um, the next step would be you essentially pick what type of data you want. You know, If you go down to step 2.5, products and variables, daily projection, projections, you see you have 1 16th degree local projections, 1 16th degree observed data, and then you pick, You know, do you want precip? Do you want minimum surface air temperature and maximum surface air temperature, right? So your temperatures and your rainfall. And then here's the last thing that discussion we had earlier, right? Um, what climate models do you want to run? What RCP scenarios do you want to do? And that's a big question of risk. What risk is your agency comfortable with taking, right? And, and how important is that for that specific asset, right? If it's a very, very high risk asset, like an interstate that's low to the ground and floods all the time, I might pick 8.5 to be conservative, right? If it's a, something that has, you know, lower risk that you have plenty of alternate routes for, you're probably fine picking 4.5. Um, but that's a decision you have to make for every project, right? And this is what we just talked about, right? Picking those different RCP scenarios. 
Um, what we normally say is you pick both to kind of see the results, see how different they are. Um, you know, just so you have an idea of what your range is and understanding what your range is helps you understand what your risk is. Um, but one of the careful things, I'll just throw this in the outside, but you know, this covered in our webinar and our um, user guide. You don't want to pick both together because then the tool averages them out. And that's not necessarily right. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, you know, the high scenario and the low scenario, it's not, it doesn't just work in an averaging, you know, it's, it's, these are nonlinear processes. So it's like, if you take the middle, if you take the halfway point between two squared and 10 squared, that's not necessarily going to give you six squared, right? That's, that's the basic idea between just taking the average of those. You don't want to do that. Um, so now, what GCMs should I select? When you go on the site, you're going to get uh, 32 GCMs. So CMIP5 was a big climate process where everyone put in their global climate models and they compared them and they said, okay, we think these 32 climate models are valid. They're not all perfect. Um, they're very different from each other, but they hit the minimum benchmarks we need to say, okay, approved. And so, well, now there's 32. How do you, how do you select them? Well, there's a couple way. Our recommendation is if you're just kind of coming in using the CMIP tool cold and you haven't talked to a climate scientist, you select them all. It's the safest because it, it kind of covers for the statistical uncertainty, right? Some models are going to overestimate this. Some models are going to underestimate. For the most part, if you follow the pack, you're going to be pretty safe. So our recommendation is you select all 32 or you at least select the group one models. Um, the best is if you can talk to a climate scientist, right? And they can go and they can look at your area and they can say, okay, this model um, covers this physical process the best. Um, as an example, you know, let's say you're in a mountainous region, right? And different models cover the snow melt or, or, or the rain over those mountains for the in different ways, right? They they um, or you're in an area with a lot of convection, right? Different models have better ways to parameterize that. So you talk, this is not something I know, but the climate scientist who works in my region may know. And so you can talk to them and you can say, hey, which of these should I use? But if you don't have that access, and many people don't, you say, all right, I'm gonna take them all. You, you don't wanna just say, okay, I'm gonna take the Merrick five, cause you know, that's giving me the numbers I want. <laughs> that's not always a, a good way to go about it. Okay, so that's the very first step. We haven't even gotten to our tool yet, right? We're just downloading the information for our tool. And so what happens is you go in, you request the data. It usually takes a few days to deliver it to you, but you know, you, it takes you, once you get comfortable, it takes you 10, 15 minutes to request the data. And then you wait around for a few days and they send it to you. And so it's gonna come to you and it's gonna come to you in what's called a net CDF file. These are very good sort of um, data files for, for people who use and work with a lot of data. Um, but it's not that easy to necessarily go through unless you have coding experience or data management experience. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's where our tool steps in. You get those files and you just plop them into our tool, right? And then you say, okay, based on these big data files, I want to know how things are going to change from my current time period 2020 into the year 2050 or into the year 2100, depending on what your application is and what your need is. Right. And so our tool comes in and it will process this data. It will process this net CDF file and then it will put it into a, a, an Excel spreadsheet. And then it just gives you a bunch of statistics that we think will be helpful for you. Right. And so, you know, after you submit it, our tool is a little quicker than the DCH website. Our tool usually takes on the order of a day, uh, plus or minus, usually under a day. Um, and once more, you just submit it. Then you go about your day and you wait to hear back. Um, and here's a little bit of the download page that you get to see it. You get a little map. There's options. You find your job down at the little panel below at the bottom of the screen. Um, and usually there's options to kind of zoom into the area you selected and look at some of the grid cells. And this is a good way to double check to make sure you're in the right area you want. I recommend doing this. You know, if you're looking at a watershed and you've sort of delineated it, 
you can double check it quick. Um, people have given us good ideas of things to add. We hope to in the future, you know, things like shape files that you can download from our CMIP tool to double check where the area is over whatever GIS tool you're using. Um, but we don't have these capabilities yet, but you know, we, we at least give you, show you where it is. And then from here, there's a little download function and you just go in, click all the way to the left at the bottom and you download your Excel spreadsheets and it gives you the information you need. And so I'll take a second to talk a little bit about the types of information you get. There's two major types. There's temperature and there's precipitation, right? <coughs> uh, temperature, um, it's a lot of average temperatures and extreme temperatures, right? And, and these are good things for all sorts of planning. I, I think uh, the pavement planner has used these, have a lot of clever ways to use this. Um, I try my hand using this data in a later example. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna emphasize try my hand because it, it has not been vetted by climate scientists. You know, And as I told you before, if you're gonna try to do anything wonky with these, it's good to talk to someone with the expertise. Um, but I'm going to give it, I'm going to give you the example anyways, because it's some good food for thought. Uh, and hopefully it'll get people thinking and, and interested. Um, and so you have average annual mean temperature, average annual max, average annual min, right? These are, these are how these temperatures are changing. As you can see, for the most part, they're going up. That's not um, too surprising. Um, but then you have other things, you know, what's your highest four day average temperature? You have day, you know, how many very hot days are you going to get as as time goes on? How many very cold days or days below freezing are you going to get? Um, these things matter for you know freeze thaw cycles of pavements um, or certain geotech applications most likely. Um, so it's good information to have. <clears throat> now for the one that most of you are probably more interested in is rainfall or precipitation, right? Uh, one of the first things I'm going to point out is that this tool focuses on daily precipitation, 24 hour precip, right? Um, the science under sub daily or shorter precip, you know, um, six hour, 12 hour precip, things like that is not very sturdy yet. Um, it's getting better uh, quickly, but it's not there yet. And at the time we were developing our tool, we felt it wasn't good enough to use. So we said, okay, we're going to use the 24 hour because it can estimate that much better. Right. So it's the one day rainfall essentially. And all our statistics are based off of that daily rainfall. Um, and so you get a lot of interesting things, you know, you're getting average total monthly precipitation average, uh, total seasonal, you get some largest three day precipitations. Um, just your average total annual, depending on what sort of planning you're in. Um, and then one of the ones that we use a lot in the hydraulics field, dealing with extreme events for bridges and such, and, and you would use as well for stormwater design, um, you know, maybe the 10-year storm or things like that, is, is the ratio of precipitation from the baseline to the future. And we're going to go over an example of that, and I'm going to talk about that and explain it soon. So um, this is where we get into it, the 10 step method. This is one of the things that we had the tool process, the data from the tool that we had process. And what the 10 step method is doing, our, our tool really makes it like a two step method. So that's kind of nice. This sounds very intimidating, <laughs> but what the 10 step method is doing is it's essentially taking your data, all the data that we found within the model, right? And it's taking your baseline, your baseline is your everyday data. Your baseline is, okay, from 1990 to 2020. That's your baseline. That's the past 30 years. And then it's comparing you to your future data, whatever future you want to look at. Do you want to look at 2020 to 2050? Do you want to look at 2070 to 2100, right? So it's taking a ratio and it's saying, okay, based on the extreme events from the past, compare how that, compare that with the extreme events of the future in the model, and then that gives you a ratio. And then based on that ratio, you just apply that ratio to whatever your, your historic rainfall is, whether you use NOAA Atlas 14 or some other rainfall, and bam, that gives you a number that you can use to estimate how much your rainfall is gonna change, right, in the future, your extreme event. That's the basic idea behind this 10-step method. And so now we walk through that. Right, so the first thing you do is you go find your historic rainfall. This is an example of a project in Colorado. 
Okay, so you go through and you say, okay, I want my 24 hour rainfall and I want my 10 year, whoops. And then I want my 10 year and you go down and you find that's three inches at 24 and one tenth because it's annual exceedance probability. It's the same thing as 10 year. 24 hour rainfall, one tenth is three inches. Okay, got my rainfall. This is what I would use in my design if I was not considering climate. Okay, so now the CMIP tool goes and get, gives you that ratio, right? It says, okay, we've looked at the model data in the CMIP tool, and we've seen that based on this model data, the extreme rain events are actually increasing by about 11%, right? That's your 1.11. And so you just... There it is. The CMIP tool just gives it to you. It makes your life very easy. 10 steps. Not, not really, right? <laughs> so now the final process that you have to do is you have to say, okay, um, well, for my design, I know that historically it's going to be three inches. I know that in the future, it's going to be an increase of 11% or 1.11. You do three times 1.11, and now your new design is 3.3 inches. And that will incorporate how that rainfall extreme will change into the future, right? So your 100-year storm, 70 years from an hour, or your 1% AEP, however you like to call it, is actually going to be closer to 3.3 in the future, right? It's not going to be 3. That that 3-inch three storm is going to be more common. And so that's kind of that process. Pretty simple, right? Pretty pretty basic and easy. And And so this is one of the ways that we've tried to really help engineers use this data, but not make it too painful, right? And so you can do it in lower risk and, and closer to everyday projects. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. So, it, you know, it, it, it's, it takes a little bit of time to learn at first. You know, you might have to invest, you know, 10, a uh, couple days to, to figure it out. But once you get it, you know, it, it, it becomes second nature to do it in these projects if if you deem it's appropriate. Um, one of the food for thought questions that I that I kind of put out, and this is something that we don't really deal with in hydraulics as much, but but I think is kind of a more interesting question for stormwater is, at what point do you incorporate this injection of of climate changes, um, hydrologic changes due to climate? And what I mean by that is, let's say you're going through your normal stormwater work flow, and I've got this little table at the bottom. You've got, normally when you're designing a pond, let's say you're putting in a big parking lot. You design your pond for the nice wooded space you have. You've got a nice wood space. You run the numbers. You figure out your flow. And then you run it, the numbers again because you've paved over that wooden space. You put down a giant parking lot, and now you design your pond to handle the increase in runoff due to that giant parking lot, right? That's very basic idea of stormwater management from a quantitative perspective. So, okay, well, that's straightforward. Well, now here it gets a little tricky. We're going back to that same process, right? But now you're thinking about climate too. And there's kind of two ways you can look at this. Way number one, you look at today. You say, okay, today there's a parking lot here. Or sorry, today there's a forest here, and today I'm running with my three inches of rainfall, right? Because I'm looking at just today. And then now I'm looking at 30 years in the future. I'm looking at a parking lot, and I'm looking at 3.3 inches of rainfall. So now you're incorporating the increase in, in runoff due to the increase in rainfall, the extra 0.3 inches, and the increase in pavement, right? So that's sort of a double whammy you have to deal with. Now, the other way to think about it is, well, you know, I'm really only designing the stormwater to handle the change in land use. I'm not necessarily designing the stormwater to also handle the change in climate, right? So in that case, you might say, okay, I'm doing 3.3 inches for existing and future conditions. I'm doing that additional climate in both existing and future. And I'm going to put down, you know, so now I'm going to go about my project. I'm going to go through the uh, I'm going to design for the forest, but I'm going to design it assuming that I'm in the future and there's that extra rainfall, that extra 0.3 inches. And I'm going to compare that with the parking lot with the extra 0.3 inches. So now you're just back to focusing on the land use. So I, those are kind of the two ways to do it. Do, do you put the do you try to handle both the climate and the land use, or are you just doing the land use? 
that's an interesting question. I don't have an answer for you. Um, that's something that honestly we're trying to figure out at FHWA. And I think that's something that the localities, your state, your stormwater groups are also going to have to try to make those decisions yourselves. Um, but it is an interesting question, I think, as people start to incorporate this climate uh, into their stormwater models. <clears throat> that brings me to a second point I'd like to touch on real quick. This goes back to the, the risk question. Um, when you're dealing with a pond or a BMP, you know, you might have a service life of, you know, five years to 25 years, depending on what type it is. But one of the things you necessarily want to think about is um, not just how often we're going to go in and, and do a full revetment, but also how easy is it to access that right of way space, right? So you may have a pond and it may last 25 years and you say, okay, I don't care about 2100. I'm going to revet this pond in, in 25 years. But let's say you're in an urban area and you barely get enough for that right of way footprint, right? Do you think in 30 years you're going to go back in there and be able to build a bigger pond? Maybe not, right? So you got to think about some of these other things too, such as such as right away footprints and things. And sometimes maybe you just go in and try to build something bigger up front because it's going to be infinitely easier than dealing with the right away acquisition in the future. Um, so these are things to think about. It's not always that case. Sometimes maybe it's very easy to just go out and get an extra sliver in the future and you don't need to worry about it. But but that's some of the things that, you know, you should be thinking about as you go into this process, not necessarily just, oh, I'm going to go in and revamp it in five years, right? <clears throat> so this brings me to the second design example. Uh, this is a wetland design example. Uh, I will preface this by saying <laughs> I did not talk to a climate scientist for this example. This is from our HDS2. I've, I've essentially updated the wetland example from our HDS2 using some of the climate information from the CMIP tool. Um, please do not follow me in this example and then point to me later and said, well, Daniel did it. <laughs> this is not a perfect. But I, I did want to bring this example because it's a little different and it, and it sort of brings some of the interesting ways to use the tool and some of the interesting thoughts that you can use as you go through a wetland design or some other more complex design where you're worried about long-term temperatures and long-term rainfalls. Um, and this is just to get people thinking of other kind of cool and interesting ways to use the tool. So. Wetland is example. This is this is from our hydrology resource. It's called HDS2, um, <clears throat> and the basic idea is that you've got an in-stream wetland. We don't really do that anymore, but it was a simple example. Um, and you create a water budget over the month. You say, okay, this much water goes into the wetland. This much water leaves the wetland, and you have requirements. You've got about okay, you need about a foot and a half right water in there at all times and you're going to max out about three and a half water 3.28 right feet um, anything over that just flows out quickly and we're going to be calculating this at a monthly basis right um and so you're looking at sort of monthly rainfalls and monthly values okay so that's that's the basic idea and so the the picture you're looking at the left is just a pretty wetland picture from <laughs> U.S. Fish and Wildlife. It is not the one we're talking about. The picture you're looking at the, on the right is the table giving the monthly budget from the HDS2 example. And if you go, if you want to go to HDS2 and look at how they do it, it's all there. It takes you through step by step how they're calculating each of those items. <coughs> and so what they what they find out, if you look at the second to last column, it's called the depth at the end of the month. If you look at this column. What it tells you at the end is essentially that you're fine. You never went below a foot and a half for the minimum water value, right? What they did was they did some statistical analysis. They found that the median year or, or mean year was 1968. And they said, okay, this is a good example year we'll use to see if our wetland can survive throughout this time period. And so they put water in, they took water out due to things like evaporation and infiltration. Um, and they said, never goes below a foot and a half, this wetland will work, right? So now let's let's talk about starting to modify it. Let's say, okay, well, you know, that was a cool example. How is that going to work now that we know that climate might be changing some of these things in the future, right? It's going to be hotter. That might lead to more evaporation, um, might lead to less base flow. 
the the water, the way the precip comes in is going to be a little different, right? <clears throat> Depending on where you are, if you're at a site with a lot of snow melt, the snow melt might come earlier in the year, right? So you might have less snow melt feeding the the wetland in the hotter, drier summer months, right? Um, there's all sorts of things you can consider and think about as you do climate when you're designing these. And this is just a very basic example. So one of the things I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, well, one of the, the things the SEMA tool gives me is it gives me an average monthly rainfall, right? And so now I'm going to do what I did sort of with the other one. And I'm going to say, okay, all right, well, let's look at January for a second. The average monthly rainfall for the current Period, time period is about 6.61 inches. And in the future, it's 7.15 inches. Okay, so it's increasing about 8%, right? And so now I can go through and I can run my calculations and I can say that the volume that's coming in is going to be closer to 3,000 as opposed to this number all the way at the end, which is the original, it's closer to 2,000, right? We're looking at the very top row in this table, January, and we're all the way at the end, looking at the monthly inflow volume modified versus the original monthly inflow volume. And so now, okay, well, now we've just considered how the climate's changing that. The climate is changing the amount of runoff coming in during these events, right, based on this average. And so you'll see now if you go back to the, the, the I guess, fourth from the left or the third from the right, you have increases and decreases, right? You have you know, in the early winter months, the, the flows are actually increasing, the average flows, but in the later spring months, the flows are, are decreasing. There's a lower ratio, and then they're going back up in the summer and back down towards the beginning of the winter, the fall. Um, and so these are ways you can sort of use the tool and say, okay, based on that, let's see how much my inflow is changing. Um, and overall, it looks like the inflow is actually increasing but it's decreasing during certain months. You know, in October and November, you're getting less water. Um, you know, in January and July, you're getting more water. Um, so one of the other things I also wanted to point out was that when you're thinking about these rainfalls, these change in rainfalls, you know, you say, oh, it's, you know, 8%, 10%. It's not going to make too big a difference. But you also got to remember what sort of hydrologic equation you're using. And, and most of the time in a lot of stormwater design, you tend to use the NRCS, unless you're using some sort of regression-based thing. But if you're doing empirical, it's likely something that's gonna be NRCS. Um, so NRCS, I've got that in the bottom right corner. You see over here, it's Q equals P minus IA squared over P plus S minus IA. IA is your initial abstraction, right? And so that's a squared term right which means that a small change in that is going to be amplified um yes you've got the p minus i over the bottom but you've got that plus s and so it doesn't it doesn't equate to just a linear change right so if you increase by eight percent your your rainfall your actual runoff may increase closer to 15 16 percent right or or it could be more, or it could be less. It's not a straight shot. And you see that's here. Some of these numbers look, you know, kind of crazy where it's like, you know, here you're decreasing on June. If you look, you're decreasing by about 8%, but you're going from 85,000, from 189,000 to 85,000, right? That's a big change for, for essentially a, a seemingly smaller change in precipitation. So this is one of the things I, I would think about as you sort of deal with these climate numbers, that the small change in rainfall may actually bump up to be something bigger. So now let's look at modifying outflows. And this was my little experiment to see if I could play with the temperature data, right? And so now what I was looking at was the um, evaporation. And so we used the basic old empirical equation for the evaporation based on average monthly temperatures um the tool doesn't unfortunately not give you average monthly temperatures so i use the best information i have as engineers we're very used to that use the best available information for the design and so i said okay well for the winter months i'll use the average winter temperature for the summer months i'll use the average summer and then for the spring and fall i'll use the average annual that that is the best i have available in the cmip tool and based on that i'm going to figure out what the future temperature is compared to the past and then modify 
my recorded temperature on month with that, right? And so when you deal with temperatures in the climate data, you don't actually do ratios, you do direct addition and subtraction, as you'll see in the equation here. Um, if we go back for just a second, you'll see that when we're dealing with rainfalls, we, we're using fractions and equation and uh, you know division, multiplication. But when we do um, temperature, you tend to use uh, addition and subtraction. Uh, don't ask me why. That's what smarter climate science people have told me. <laughs> so, and so the basic idea is: okay, I'm taking the the modeled future data, subtracting the modeled past data, and then I'm adding that to whatever my observed is in the real world. And that's going to give me what my design is, right? So, you know, let's say in the model, just to give you an example, the model your 80 degrees uh, is the baseline in the model, your future is 85 degrees, right? So 85 minus 80 is five. And then let's say your observed is actually uh, 75 degrees, right? The model, one of the key points is the model does not get it exact. The model does not get it perfect with what happened in real life. Um, but what the model does is it's accurate to each other, right? So the basic idea is that, well, if it increased by five in real life, the model is going to accurately catch that, even though it's not giving you the exact correct number in the year 2020. Right. And so that's why we always like to do these model to model comparisons, get that comparison and then apply it to our real today value that we've measured. And so that's what we do here. We say, OK, you know, we go through and we look at the temperatures, we see how much they change, and then we modify our evaporation. So here you've seen I've modified my evaporation in the last two columns. There's the original and the modified. And for the most part, across the board, you get more water loss from evaporation, right? Okay, so now we know that we're going to lose more water from evaporation, and sometimes we'll get a little more, sometimes we'll lose a little more from the rainfall. Out of curiosity, how does this all pan out? <coughs> uh, it didn't make a difference in this case. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Um, these numbers got a little bit lower at times. Um, you know, it, the the low point height went from 2.11 in August. It started at 2.22 and it went to 2.11, right? But you're still well above that 1.5, 1.8 safe design. And so that goes to show you that depending on your design application, you're not always going to see a big difference from incorporating the climate data, right? Sometimes you might and sometimes you might not. It depends. Um, but it's good to go through the process, especially if the process is easy and not too costly. Once you get used to these things and find ways to, to do this efficiently and quickly, you know, it pays off in the costs and sometimes, you know, it's worth it. Um, this example took me a little longer, but for the early example, the 10-step method, you know, I can do in 30 minutes. And to get peace of mind that nothing changed with just an additional 30 minutes, to me, is worth it, right? Um, and then sometimes it's it's not that there's no change. There's actually a significant change and it's worth accounting for. So, so you know, at the end of the day, there was no change in this wetland example. And we know that it's safe for the future climate condition too. In my very botched <laughs> hypothetical example, I did not consult a climate scientist for. <laughs> like I said, please don't quote me and use this against me in the future. <clears throat> so, you know, when shouldn't I use the CMIP tool? We talked a lot about, about ways to use it. When shouldn't you use it? Well, the first thing is, are there better sources of data available, right? Um, there are a lot of states that do projects with local climate scientists that these people really focus on their area and give them good climate data and good climate practices, right? So if you've already got something like that, don't use our tool. Our tool is much more general and our tool is meant for people who don't necessarily have those resources, right? But if you've got something better um, that's been vetted, then I, I would use that over our tool. Our tool is fine. You know, it's it's good enough just as the NCR, NCRS method isn't a perfect estimator of rainfall, but it's good enough for many practices. That's kind of how our tool is. Um, but use the better thing if you got it. Uh, is your project service life short? You know, this goes back to that stormwater question and as well as the sediment trap. Sediment tra trap, two years, who cares? Yes, it's short. Don't, don't ignore it. You can ignore it. You know, a BMP that's there five to 10 years, 
um, you know, maybe you could ignore it most of the time, but maybe if you're going to have issues accessing right of way in the future, you might want to consider it a quote unquote longer service life. Um, and then the last is, are there other documented phenomenon in the watershed that may be more important than potential climate changes? Um, and honestly, you know, sometimes there's decadal or, or longer century patterns in, hydro, in hydrology. Um, a lot of US, very smart USGS people have mapped these things out and, and found them. And, and so if you're using the CMIP tool, you may not be accounting for that. Or it may be using data that falls into that, you know, 100 year drought period. And so it's going to predict something that's not necessarily right. So there's little weird things like that you got to check out occasionally. It's not too often, but it, but it does happen. And then there's other things like if you have a ton of land use change, are you going to be able to catch a statistical signal with the climate data? I, I still, my personal preference is to still include the climate data, even if you have a lot of land use change, but um, there have been arguments against it as well. So now I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but you guys can, you know, um, contact me later and, and ask for more information on any of these. These are a lot of our different resilience tools. Um, the key one for this conversation is all the way on the left. It's the NCHRP 1561 provisional report. Uh, and this report gives a lot of practices for incorporating climate data into hydrologic analysis for transportation projects, right? <clears throat> and, and the basic idea behind it is that it's trying to create ways that are relatively simple, um, that, that don't require advanced degrees or advanced expertise that, that most people can use. Um, it explains a little bit of the background behind the climate. It explains a little bit about background behind the hydrology. It's a very, very good source. Um, it is provisional because these, this report was not extensively scientifically tested. Right, that's that's a pretty rigorous process and cost a lot of money and time, and, and it was not. But we have used some of these techniques, and we've seen that the results, for the most part, seem reasonable. Uh, so that's why we're okay using some of these methods within the CMIP tool, even though it hasn't been, like I said, um, fully scientifically vetted. Um, one of the things when you're doing any sort of climate design is 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 what I like to call the common sense factor. You know, if you're doing climate data analysis and you're doing an extreme event and you say, okay, in the year 2100, I use, I use the climate data and it's actually telling me that my flows are going to be reduced by 60%. In that situation, I would just ignore the climate data and I would just go with your historic baseline statistics, right? You don't want to necessarily take that risk and that seems wrong. On the flip side of that, if, if your climate data is telling you the flows are going to increase by 500%, well, that hits the point where one, you know, it's fishy, but two, it's also just not even affordable, right? So many times you're going to be capped between not wanting to go below your baseline or your natural statistical value and not wanting to go above what you can afford. And the tool most of the time falls within that sweet spot. But when it starts to go out of that, you know, that's, that's on you as the engineer to try to check that. Or if you're not sure, to ask someone who may be able to help you. Um, so that's that's a little bit about that, but it's it's still an excellent resource. It's got some excellent practical techniques, and, and it's got a lot of good information for those interested in learning more about it. And so now I'm going to do a couple of very quick advertisements. Uh, one is for a NCHRP report that's coming out in the near future. Um, it's 2020 2044 parentheses 23, and essentially what they did was they tested a lot of these climate you know. In, court, in using climate data and hydrologic analysis practices on real projects. Um, there's a range of DOTs. You can see on the right, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Maryland, Maine, North Carolina, um, all across the country. And they measure how long did it take these DOTs to learn to use these methods? You know, how easy was it? You know, was it, was it 10 hours? Was it 250 hours? What sort of impact did it have? You know, were if it was a culvert, were you doubling the size of the culvert, or did you not change it at all? And then benefit cost. You know, how how much was this saving you in the long term? Um, was it saving you anything, or was it a huge savings? And so this is all very practical, helpful information from engineers who have actually used used these techniques we talked about, used the CMIP tool, 
and gone through the process and what their feedback is and what their thoughts are. So I, I think it's an extremely valuable resource and I think it's supposed to be published in July or August. So I, I, I'd keep my uh, eyes peeled for that. The last thing I wanna talk about is um, the NHI course development. Um, at, at Federal Highway Administrations, we've, um, Rob Cafalenos has led this effort from the resilience team. We've developed a course on resilient design. And it talks about essentially using climate data in all facets of engineering, you know, pavements, geohazards, um, flooding. We talked a lot about that today, but as well as coastal hydraulics, right? Um, and we really talk about how all three of these may change into the future and how you can anticipate those changes as well as design for them. And so we've piloted it in North Carolina. We got some very positive feedback so far, and we are finalizing it and hope to have it out this year. Alongside that is four webinars that you can get. Um, you can get them with the course or you can get them separately. Take them online at any time. And they're just very great, straightforward, hour-long sessions that teach you a little bit about climate, vulnerability, and all these processes that go into resilience. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Shora Salgado again. So if you have any questions, you can email me. And um, you know we've got a sh good 30-minute Q&A now. And Rob Kafalenos as well. Um, he did. He helped me put this presentation together. And he's on the resilience team and and sort of big picture resilience things. He's excellent um, resource as well. Thanks.